Welcome everyone. My name is Mary Ma and I'm a member of the Kellogg Alumni Relations team. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar in our series, Conversations with Distinguished Alumni. Today's presentation will last for about one hour. We encourage you to submit any questions for our speaker at any time via the Q&A icon that's located at the bottom of your screen. We will address audience questions towards the end of the program. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Kellogg's YouTube channel. With that, I'm very happy to turn it over to Dean Francesca Cornelli to start our program. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today for our virtual conversation with Distinguished Alumni Series. Uh, it's been a great success and I am uh, delighted to be back uh, with another amazing alumna. Uh, Alex Young and uh, thank you Alex for uh, being uh, available uh, to talk and it's a uh, it's a particular pleasure for me I just want to mention I hope you all uh, received recently the um, the uh, information about the transformative gift that Andrake has made to Kellogg for advancing women in business by creating a special network. And therefore I feel it, it, it was completely by accident, but at the same time it's great to, uh, to follow that announcement with a conversation with an alumna who has been so successful. And also, as we will talk later, she's also been very committed to the advancement of women in business and exactly through the power of the network. So how appropriate, and it just feels like this is exactly Kellogg. This is, this is what, what we do. Uh, but let me tell you a bit more about uh, Alex. She has uh, over 25 years of experience in investment management, both as an investor and a business leader, both in the US and Europe. So it also brings that global element and hopefully we will cover about it, cover it. And most recently, she was a partner and head of Europe at Oak Hill Advisor, which is a US-based 40 billion investment firm specializing in alternative credit and private equity. It's so an area that is still booming and will be very interested in that. So she brings also really the, the point of view of a global portfolio management uh, with her. So welcome, Alex, and thank you for joining us today. Delighted to be here. Uh, hello, everybody. Delighted to spend time with you, Francesca. It's been, we were just saying it's been too long, but, but, uh, but excited to be here and talk more. Yes, yes. So well, last time we met in person and now we are virtually, but we are all getting used and it's just great to get uh, to get all uh, together. So uh, let me show, I, I, let me remind everybody as I ask questions, please put in a, a question in the chat and I can weave them in as they feel uh, uh, touching the things. But, you know, as, as I mentioned, right, you are in alternative investment, uh, private equity, uh, investment, private credit, you know, really something that everybody is going to look about it by looking forward right now. So when you were also before you were a Grey Wolf, then Oak Hill, and you were there during the 2008 uh, global recession and recovery. So what, are, what lessons do you think you learned that now, then that would be useful now for us all? looking at the pandemic and after the pandemic. Sure, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you, you mentioned 25 years and I kind of, um, it's scary to hear that number, but it's true. And, you know, we've been through several very distinct cycles in, in those 25 years going, going back, um, you know, emerging, the emerging markets crisis. I remember being on the Goldman Sachs trading desk and, and, um, and watching that unfold and obviously the dot-com bubble. Um, the European, cri you know, the financial crisis had many, many crises. Uh, we obviously had, you know, significant issues across our financial systems globally in terms of deleveraging, but there was also a sovereign, there was a sovereign crisis in there. There were so many different political crises, and I was in Europe at the time um, of, of the last crisis, and then also had U.S. responsibilities, so really saw, you know, that devastation. 
the current pandemic is a very distinct cycle as well. So each one has a different trigger um, that, that builds over many, many years. And so, you know, the financial crisis was really about the leverage in the financial system and, and real loss in our system that needed to be recognized and flushed out. And to be frank, you know, we still see banks, you know, flushing some of that out in Europe. They just move slower and take losses slower. When you look at the pandemic, it, there was a couple things. One is the suddenness of it, obviously, but it was more of a, a demand crisis that happened rather than a building of, of imbalances in our economy. And I think there's been a lot of great academic work around, around that um, and a lot of my peers um, talking about the lack of those imbalances. Now, certainly the market is building and, and, and valuations are, are high today, but but what, what is clear from the pandemic is that that demand, that sudden demand drop required sudden structural adjustments. Um, and, and I think the difference in this one is really, it is so industry targeted um, and, and where some industries are really, really in, in extreme distress and other industries, um, you know, technology being obvious, is, is a boom. And so we're seeing this acceleration of, of demand in some industries. So that bifurcation is something I think that's relatively um, differentiating. The other thing I think is it really is a, a, a time of have and have nots where the capital markets being supported by, by monetary policy, fiscal policy is really throwing capital and the capital markets have been perfectly happy to finance large businesses. And you've seen, um, you know, we're through credit spreads in, in the leveraged finance markets. You know where our equity markets are. Um, so, you know, the, these things have, more capital is getting to there. Where it is not getting and where we're having real issues is actually in the small business. And if you look at it, the small business is what drives, you know, our, our economy. And, and so it's how do you get, how do you get the capital to the businesses that need it in an efficient way? And I think the other learning is in order for us to get out of the, the, the great financial um, crisis, it was, if you look at it, a real partnership between public uh, government and, and private capital. Um, and depending on what the situation is, you had a combination working together to uh, help um, build the economy back in. And I think that that, that is one learning for how are we going to address um, the inequalities across our economy, which obviously there are multiple effects of that, those inequalities, both in terms of access to capital and access to support in a meaningful way. And what we're seeing is the fiscal, the, the policies from a monetary policy standpoint is certainly helping the larger companies by access to capital, uh, whether it's you know looking at the SPAC market, whether it's looking at the high yield market, the, obviously the, the equity markets, but what we're not seeing is that expansion of capital um, directly targeted to, I would say the small and medium sized businesses. So I'm actually already getting some question and some are connected to what you're saying. So I get one who says, where should you looking for deal opportunity? Should you be more interested in rather distressed companies or companies being winners of COVID-19 times? I'm afraid I'm a fundamentalist at heart. So for me, it's it's always going to be, there's certainly themes um, and, and I'm always attracted to places where there's dislocation and capital is not flooding to. So there are going to be winners in those industries that um, are suffering from this lack of demand, this demand fall. They are, I think they're making difficult decisions. They're doing cost savings. They're changing the way their business works. They're leveraging technology. The businesses that will be there when demand starts coming back are the businesses that we focus on. So I think there's going to be a real consolidation. And we're seeing that in the retail space where market shares, you know, where retail was distressed, frankly, before this, but the acceleration of and the consolidation of the larger players who are who are becoming more even more efficient to the um, to the detriment of the smaller the smaller businesses. So I think we're going to see changes in market share in those distressed industries. So uh, you know you're 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 looking for the winners that are treated like they're going to die tomorrow. Um, and and I will you know you look at some of the capital that's been raised in the most distressed industries. I mean Carnival Cruise Line right at the time of the 
um, right at the time of, of the crisis really gearing up in the spring raised billions of dollars from, 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 the, from the debt markets. So I think there's ways to find it. I, I, in, in markets where the public markets have now decided that everything is fine and, and the, the valuations are quite high, um, there's, it's no surprise that I find better um, opportunities in the private markets. And I think we're seeing institutional capital move structurally towards private and alternatives um, to capture that a liquidity premium. So I think that's a, a general theme um, in private credit focused on those companies that may not be large cap, but more mid cap um, or smaller um, is, is another way um, to take advantage of opportunities. I mean, there, at the end of the day, it is always bottoms up um, looking at management, looking at the financials, and looking at the viability through the cycle, not today, but but o over the time, and how they'll they'll survive and thrive. Sorry, you're clearly generating a lot of interest because I see a lot of uh, question coming in. Let me ask one more. You know, very. How do you account for inflationary perspective in incoming years? Um, you know, that's a very big topic, a big concern that, that people have, particularly where, where, you know, where it is today. I think that, that there is certainly a flood of capital in the market. We have, you know, some real changes happening that's changing what would be normally very inflationary or, or inflationary monetary policy. We have demographic and we have technological and productivity changes happening at a very, you um, strong rate. And I think those have been um, deflationary. And, you know, I, I don't think this, it doesn't seem to me, I should say, it doesn't seem to me that this Fed is concerned with inflation for a lot of the reasons why, um, you know, that we've seen in our brethren in, in Japan, we've seen it in Europe, is, is it, it's, it's uh, we've got a lot of deflationary forces that are helping to keep that at bay. Obviously with this level of stimulus, um, I think we have to be very, very mindful because when it turns, it turns quickly and the, the capital markets um, will pay real attention and we could have some bumps. Um, but, but today it's hard to see that in the very near term. Now I am testing because I'm getting a lot of questions. Uh, I see another one. There was also before in the general, if the SMEs are most at risk given the pandemic, what are you, what do you, should you do or what should the market government do in the immediate near term to ease these critical participants in the US economy? I, I'm a believer in the government partnering with institutions um, and financial partners, private financial partners to help actually deliver that kind of um, that kind of support. Um, and I think we're starting to see real movement and leadership in our institutional investor base across a number of different um, a num number of different areas. Uh, obviously climate, obviously inequalities in our economy and across our social system. Um, and I think those inequalities of getting to, to small business loans, the SBA, Small Business Association. There's firms that are being started today from uh, you know large capital firms targeted to do that in line. Um, so so I would hope that there would be a partnership um, approach. So uh, clearly people uh, uh, are uh, asking. So I, I see several questions which are like, are the stock market too hot in the U.S.? Is the correction <laughs> in order? I see another one. What are um, it, it's whether, are you concerned about the bubble for me? Now, I know you don't have <laughs> a crystal ball, but uh, I, it seems like everybody is very interested in your point of view. So I, I, I think everybody in, in the market um, are asking those questions. And, you know, the, the businesses that are trading at very elevated, I, I am not a near-term stock market um, uh, technician, nor, nor do I make any kind of prog prognosis on year-end S&P. That's just, just not the way I invest. I invest company by company. Um, what I will say is, is the, the companies that are um, earning the types of multiples and expectations that are being put on them are showing significant growth. And the other thing that I've really just, at, at coming from being an early credit investor, a significant amount of cash generation. 
And, um, and so, you know, this does not feel like the dot-com bubble where we were literally where the market was valuing companies with, you know, rev on revenue multiples with, you know, no cash flow within five years of site and being valued at billions, billions of dollars. This does not feel like that. It feels like people don't have any place to put their capital. And the choice is uh, the fixed income market at very, very low uh, rates and, and spreads or equity markets that um, are certainly valued uh, high relative, but, but from a rel from an equity premium standpoint are still trading at the premium is still on the, the higher end versus historical trends. So I don't, you know, I don't call bubbles. I certainly think there's some companies that are completely overvalued. Um, but, uh, but, but as a whole, I, I think you have to look at relative value among asset classes um, and look at uh, multiples in the reference of very low interest rates. You can't compare a 25 times PE today with interest rates at this level versus when interest rates were 7% and something was trading at 20, 23, 25 times. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think we should spend our time on, on, you know, whether the market, I think there's a lot of people talking about that, that follow the market's gyrations, you know, day to day, hour to hour. Um, but those are my general comments. Now, let me just also talking in general, right, because you've, you've been so much in the investment management community. So because of the pandemic, what permanent changes do you think will occur in the investment management community? And what will be, you know, and because of the economic impact, do we see good things, bad things? Um, look, I, I think it's changed us all personally and professionally. And I think many of those changes are positive from an efficiency standpoint and a productivity standpoint and leveraging technology in a way we should have probably been doing over the last few years, but now we're really doing. Um, I, I think from an asset management or investment management standpoint, I think uh, the pandemic in, in, in conjunction with some you know, alarming events across our society, um, the combination of those two things have highlighted the inequity um, in our economy um, in, 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 in many areas in the world. And so the question is, what can investment management do to help right those, uh, those inequalities? And, and I think there's a lot of ways we can. And I, I, I am a believer that the capital allocators can, can, can really exert the change. And at the end of the day, it's the capital allocators that will drive change. And when we talk a little bit about the changes we've seen in diversity and boards and, and, and in our business, um, a lot of that is coming from that. I think one of the downsides that, you know, as a woman in business, we're seeing an alarming rate of women leaving jobs because it's simply, uh, even with the fle more flexible way of using technology to, to work um, you know, work online, it is, it's, 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 it's too much. Um, it's too much for some. So we're losing a lot of pipeline. That is what I'm worried about in our business, uh, particularly, but across, um, across women business leaders that could be future C-suite. Um, you know, there's, there's data around that. And I think companies have to be intentional, intentional supporting their, they're high, you know, high performing um, women, um, men with additional responsibilities, just people that are going through this because you wanna be thinking about building your management team in five years. And so that means that you might have to adjust things for the next year um, with a light of having a more diverse um, and wider view of a management team. Given we were talking about exactly, you started talking about the diverse teams. Uh, you're a founding board member of the Women's Business Collaborative, uh, which is whose mission is to achieve equal position, pay, and power for all women in business. Uh, can you take t tell us a bit more about this group and how the idea came together? Yeah. So um, I came back from Europe after building out our business kind of across private, private public credit and private equity in Europe. And I came back to the States and I was doing a transatlantic commute. It was crazy, but I finally kind of reestablished myself in, in New York. And um, I started to look around and I said, okay, now, now that I actually have time, 
I really want to focus on trying to, you know, show some leadership in our industry. Um, I serve on boards. Um, I obviously am an active shareholder in some cases and can drive changes in the management teams. I, how do I want to really try to give back, for lack of a better word? And I went to go see all these organizations. There's seven, eight different organizations that are focused on getting more women and diverse um, uh, board members. There's Then I went to the women in finance organizations. There's five or six different organizations focused on women in the finance industry. Um, I've been a leader of a business. So then I was talking to those catalysts in the C-suite. And what, what occurred to me in doing that due diligence, because I kind of treated it like a deal, was that um, one is everybody had a similar general mission of trying to change the numbers. The second is we've had a huge increase in the number of these organizations. And three, no one was talking to each other. Uh, and, and, you know, or, or not talking to each other in a formal organized way. And there was uh, definitely overlap. Um, they're all doing amazing things. And if we could somehow bring them together and start trying, yet, yet all these things were happening in all these organizations, yet the numbers weren't changing. I mean, I looked in our business, less than 2% of assets under management, institutional assets under management are managed by women. I, I just looked at that number. I said, how can it be? Like, I, how can it be after 30 years in this business that it's still, there's no other women, in, you know, running capital. And so I talked to a friend of mine who sits on a lot of these boards, who's been an, a very active leader and visionary in, in women leadership issues. And she said, I'm going to put this together. I sit on four of these boards and we need them to all work together. And it was her idea to create this and us, so there's five founding board members to create a consortium, not another organization, but actually create a structure and a consortium. And we have 43 of the leading women in business organizations, and they work together under eight different topics, working groups. So the idea is collaborate, leverage each other's best practices, work on things together. Instead of having 10 different conferences, have one and share all the membership. The board organizations now have created their own database. So instead of them all having you know, different databases, they have one database and they're working together to try to fill those with some of their some of their membership. I mean, these are real action items to change the numbers one by one and, and, and as a group. And I am chairing, as, as one of the board members, I help chair two initiatives. One is uh, getting more women as capital allocators. And it is my belief that until there's parity in capital allocation and CIOs and women in investment committees controlling where the capital goes, that we're not gonna see the change across leadership and equality in terms of access to capital, in terms of um, leadership and in financial institutions, which I believe drives capital to different parts of the economy. And so that is, that is one, we have partner organizations that are the leading women partner organizations, 100 Women in Finance, PE Win, which is Senior Women in PE, Women in Fund Finance. There's, there's a lot of information on the website. The goal is to work together to change the numbers and accelerate the progress um, and uh, and it's been a it has been a full time job during right now, um, but it's been incredibly rewarding to see the change. And the other is access to capital for women owned businesses and accelerating scale capital for women owned businesses. I, I can't tell you how delighted I am. I'm like you see, it's a Kellogg alumna with a Kellogg spirit that wants to make them all and yeah. have an impact. That is so true, and we're so proud uh, that you're doing these things. And let me ask you, but still in that area, right? There's a, the diversity in leadership beyond gender really has become a big concern, especially you know since the last year. And so within the financial sector, what particular opportunity or challenges do you see to achieving more representation inclusion? I mean, you were talking a bit about it, but also in more general, what opportunities and, and, and challenges, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's um, the media has, you know, the, the good good news is the media has paid more attention to it. Shareholders are starting to pay attention to it. So certainly the the, the financial industry covers a lot of different um, segments. There's financial services, the banks, the investment banks are really showing leadership 
in trying to build the pipeline of leaders and certainly seeing Jane Frazier and at Citibank showing that kind of leadership. I, I we're seeing more and more women being led into the room in terms of the C-suite of, of banks. I would really like to see that. And they're, they're showing leadership. I think where there's a lot of opportunity, frankly, is in the investment management side. Um, mutual funds have done a better job. The alternative space across private equity, credit, infrastructure, venture have, have a long, long way to go. There's increased focus now, but what I've seen is the reality is until women start uh, start actually establishing firms with a differentiated culture that actually values uh, diverse perspectives, um, I think it's gonna be hard to do it in the existing uh, structure uh, and culture of some of the investment firms. So they're gonna have to be really intentional and I think that there are leaders in our business um, that are really committed to this and, um, and, and I, I salute them and they're trying to figure out the best way to make really hard cultural changes um, to bring women into investment committees and get the pipeline um, because there's a, number, there, there's, there's a number of challenges in existing structures in, in, in getting that to be more diverse. And, and I know you have a project in incubation that could help in that direction. Would you like to talk a bit about it? Sure, I can. I, um, I made the decision after spending a lot of time in the WBC, but I made the decision a few years ago um, that the only way that I think to make change in terms of the leadership, um, getting more women partners, getting more women portfolio managers, I, th I thought the only way I'm really going to do it is prove that we can do it. And so I, I made the difficult decision with the support of my um, of Oak Hill CEO and partners to step down as a partner and um, start to work on solving this problem in a commercially feasible uh, way that really highlights that diverse investment teams and leverages diverse investment teams actually drive out performance. The diverse teams have differentiated portfolios and networks have different perspectives. And if you are able to really leverage those different perspectives, you can create a portfolio um, that really can outperform. And um, there's a lot of great data now, and we're working on other ways to get data to, to prove that out. But at the end of the day, I am a big believer that if you get a diverse group around an investment committee table, that you will um, drive a different view from every other firm because just having a diverse investment team is a differentiator today. And you get the, or you walk into a room with 20 people that all went to the same business school, not Kellogg, went to a, the same business school and um, follows the same sports teams and, you know, and just have the same social circle, you're going to get the same view. And um, as much as I love a lot of my former, all my former colleagues, sometimes, you know, it, it was, you know, a, it, I was, I was, people would look at me with six heads, like, wait, where, why is she saying that? Like, I don't even understand that perspective. And so I'm trying to create something that actually proves that out and also serves as an incubator because we have three main issues in the investment management industry and particularly in private equity and alternatives. Um, one is our LPs, our investors are scaling up and they need to be with a platform, one, one that has operational excellence, risk management, compliance, and has institutional class back office. So new investment firms, and women that have tried to start them have really faced um, difficulties around that. Also, the investors may not understand and be able to be responsible for driving the business of the business. This, so scale is definitely an issue. Um, they have to be much bigger in order to actually make the economics work for their investment team. The inherent cultures of the existing firms is not allowing people to actually be, be you know, reach their potential as investors for whatever reason. Certainly some cultures are better than others, but in my due diligence, I found that the women that were around my level or just under or, just, or around the same level were inherently unhappy, but they felt stuck. And, and so I really wanted to create this ability where we could have the scale, the economics, the best in class operational, but be a home for this incredible talent. And whether they wanna start their own firm and help them start their own firm, or actually be part of an investment team that's a diverse investment team. And so it's a multi, the concept is a multi-strategy platform where we have best in class um, operational risk management and leadership. Um, but we also create an ecosystem of talented, diverse investment teams 
that either want to start their own strategy, but at, at all of them with a culture of inclusivity and sharing an ecosystem and with the one thing, the unifying um, investment culture of inclusivity and um, you know fundamental views on companies um, and fundamental analysis. And so I've been you know really incubating that concept with existing large capital platforms that want to embrace more uh, more of this kind of mission. Um, as well as some people that would like it to be a de novo. So I'm in the middle of just starting those conversations around this concept. And I hope other people, you know, take those ideas and build them in their, their own firms um, and, and, and try to solve the problem that way. Well, I find that incredibly inspiring. So we will stay tuned and see uh, <laughs> and see the development. But I wanted to also bring, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, being more inclusive and more diverse at uh, Kellogg, we also talk about that in terms of like, um, of international, right? How, how do you bring in a different point of view? So, and, and I see actually, you know, a lot of questions coming in about like Europe versus the US. But let me start with a bigger question, which is Zeli, you, you have said that moving to Europe required you to gain a deep understanding of the cultural and management differences compared to the US. So how did you go about that understanding? What were the more challenging part? I think this is something that really we want our students at Kellogg to, to, to learn and appreciate. I think when I, when I look back, I was telling a story the other day to my, my uh, 18 year old son, um, I, the, the answer is you listen. And, and, you know, I remember the first time I, I did two different working times in London and Goldman sent me to London the first time, Goldman Sachs. And I was working with a partner there and uh, we went to go visit a company that we had invested in and it wasn't doing very well. Um, it was a distressed investment. So what, that's how we started. And, and we go in in there and I was kind of used to an American approach with companies management. And um, I, I got very impatient while my partner led the meeting. And I just thought, what, why doesn't he just get to the point? Like we're, we're going around in circles around this issue. Why don't we just say like, what happened? You know, like, and I was sitting and I was sitting and I went home that night. I was like, this is nuts. And I found myself when I kind of started to watch him over and over again, how much information and diligence he was able to pull out that was not in the numbers, was not in the financial statements, was not in any of the 10Ks or 10Q, it wasn't in any annual reports. Through this just, you know, very deliberate state of questioning. And it was a very, um, I would say UK approach, uh, British approach. Um, and, um, and at the same time, I, I saw him when we went to Germany to meet another one, um, that where that approach didn't work. And I actually watched the interaction and um, you would took meetings and meetings with different companies from different countries over a period of, you know, I spent 15 of the last 30 years in, in investing across Europe and the US and seeing those differences and picking up on those clues. And at the end of the day, it's listening and watching, number one, being open and, and realizing that whatever works in the US is not gonna work here. And, um, and I used to tell my, my Oak Hill partners all the time, it's like, you can't, like, it's a different world. It's going to take like, you know, a week and, um, and, and they want it now and all of that. And, and it really was a differentiator approach with all my American colleagues that came over during different crises to try to take advantage of the European opportunities. Um, not having a very American approach with those management teams or European banks did not work. And, and we ended up really driving some interesting transactions because of that, that openness. So I would say I learned to listen. I also learned that, you know, that you've got to take your American hat off and you have to learn, you really have to watch for, you know, quite some time. Um, and I'm sure my team in Europe right now, if, if anyone ends up watching would be, would be giggling because I used to tell them that as well. That's actually very interesting. This is exactly what we are trying to say, uh, uh, Akela. We are trying to talk about global in terms of multicultural. Exactly, you know. And I'm, uh, I, I think it's not an accident that you're a Akela alumna and you, you promoted uh, that approach. Let me ask you one thing, reconnected to the women, right? The, uh, what are the differences in US and Europe on how women were regarded in finance or how their career tended to progress? 
It's interesting. And I'm kind of sad with my conclusion when I thought about this. Um, but I have to say that I think women face more barriers in the US. And I didn't really appreciate that until probably the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. Um, and may, maybe it's my seniority in the business or, or maybe it's looking at the, the fact that we have many, many countries with women business, women business, I'm sorry, women leaders, presidents and prime ministers decades before the US had uh, any sort of women representation in large pools of our government, let alone the executive branch, vice president and president. And, and I think that there's some cultural biases that I think a lot of people don't want to admit, but you just have to look at Germany. You have to look at, I mean, obviously Iceland, but like, what about Thatcher? I mean, if you think about what Thatcher went through in the UK, and, you know, we struggled to get, and, and thankfully we have a, a you know, uh, such a strong, you know, leader in, in, in our vice president today to show, show the way, but the fact it's taken, taken us this long it, um, is also kind of astounding to me. So I, I personally, I didn't really realize it until more recently in my career when I was young, I, there were no women in our business. I was on the trading floor. There are no women. I mean, there was none. So I just was doing my work head down. I didn't, I just thought women didn't want to be on a trading floor. I, I didn't think of it as anything, um, you know, sinister. I just was like, this is what I want to do and nobody else wants to do it. Great. That's fine. Um, so I, I think um, it's more that that's kind of my view. I think in finance, there's a lot of, you know, I had a great network of senior women that have done phenomenally well in Europe. I think there are more and more in US. I think we're moving in the right direction for sure. It just took us a little longer than I would have liked to, to get there. That's interesting. That's not what I would have guessed the answer, but I can see your point too. It is, it's very interesting for, 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 as a European arriving in the US, I'm learning about the US. And each country is different again. Like, so each country is remarkably different and I'm sure you would have a view from there. I, you know, I think I think about the UK, I think about um, maybe, maybe I think about the UK more than anything. Yeah. So I, I shouldn't comment. Obviously, Scandinavia has, has always, um, you know, showed us leadership in that area. So th those are the things that, but, but there's certainly parts of Europe where it's de definitely not true. So. <laughs> and now I want to ask you more, but at the same time, there are so many questions here about also your view about investment. So I want to come back a little bit. Otherwise I feel guilty because they are clearly so interesting in your point of view. And given that we talked about Europe, there is a question here about whether you would like right now to invest in emerging markets in Europe because of Brexit, or do you still see the UK as the center for the finance? Um, there has been such remarkable change. In fact, my we moved um, out of London as a family. I was still going back and forth on the day of Brexit. Um, so we actually Brexited, <laughs> our family Brexited. Um, but uh, there's a remarkable change happening. Um, and uh, so it's very different environment than when I was living and, and working every day there. Um, I, I think the political um, instability um, and the, the series of political crises um, really makes it challenging to, um, feel great about structural growth in some of those markets. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I, we're obviously watching what's happening in Italy. And I think Francesca, you can tell us how many governments were on here, but, um, and I, and I, you know, we, we can't, we, you know, we, we've got our own issues here too. So I, I but um, I, I think you've got to look at some demographic issues in Europe in a real hard way. Um, and those demographics are a tough, a tough fight. Um, I think we're starting to see more entrepreneurship and growth in technology um, on, in Eastern Europe. And that was really happening. We did some Romanian investments and um, Eastern European investments probably seven or eight years ago that was really around the outsourcing um, opportunity. Um, so I think there's pockets of really interesting investing. I do think the political climate really dampens growth in a lot of ways because businesses don't know how to operate. They don't know what rules they're following. And, and I think that Brexit is a experiment right now on, on, we know it's gonna be more expensive. We know there's gonna be more trade friction. 
Um, and, and I think companies are going to have to spend more to adjust to uh, addressing the European market. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, leveraging each other and reducing friction costs and trade. So, so this was kind of an alarm, not alarming, but, you know, it's a rise of a, po you know, a populism that's creating inefficiencies and higher costs to trade. And, and that's, that's a reality. So I, I don't have a perfect answer for that. I just think you have to be mindful of the challenges and have to really find some high growth opportunities within the markets rather than certain countries over others. I actually do think this is the perfect answer. So <laughs> now I forgot to mention that um, you're actually a board member at NVR. And I see actually here another question about someone who knows that you're a board member of NVR and says, could she kindly comment on the housing market and her views on how she sees it over the next five to seven years? You know, we, we talked about the winners and losers in the environment that we have today. And with the level of interest rates, um, the, the functioning of the mortgage market, people's lit, people living in their house many more hours a day than anybody thought they would, um, has, has created a bit of a perfect storm. I should say in the addition of, of, of the pandemic's impact on city centers has created a bit of a perfect storm for the home building um, businesses. So I, you know, interest rates are the main driver for people's decisions to refinance and move. Obviously the consumer um, for the most part, depending on you know, where you are in, in, in your in, in, in socio kind of economics, but the consumer has cash um, and the government seems to be giving more. So, so I, you know, I, I think the structural places are there. The real risk for the home building market, and I'm, I'm not making any NVR specific comments because it's not appropriate for me to do so, but I would say generally, if you look at home building through cycles, it's a very cyclical um, business and industry. It is, it, you know, it, it does have bumps when, when interest rates move up uh, quickly and, and it's not, they're not big bumps, they're just adjustments. And, and that's, that has to do with, with um, that has to do with people financing their homes and obviously unemployment. Um, what I will say is that there's a other kind of structural dynamic going on. And the real interesting thing will be this, you know, flight, flight of the urban residents and the millennials and the next real set of home buyers and how they feel about what had been staying in the city longer into the tech hubs and all of that fleeing to the suburbs. I mean, if you look at New York and, and you know, where I live in Connecticut, it's just nonstop, you know, flight out of those places. So, you know, how long does that last? Does that revert? Because that has been a big structural underpinning for the people that are active in the suburban markets. Um, but, but at the end of the day, we're watching very closely inflation and interest rates and, you know, all the businesses, you know, all the home builders are, are you know, are thoughtful on, on, on the cycle and knowing that the cycle, you know, it is a cycle. Um, but today, the structural underpinnings are all there. And here there's another one that says, thanks, Alexandra, for a very informative talk. A quick question on your perspectives for 2021-22, I assume, which asset, class, which asset classes do you see will hedge risk better and which classes may see higher investment returns? Um, wow. Okay. So that's a crystal ball question. And I know that's because you fair. don't have a crystal ball. That's not fair. Um, like your but, answer. So they ask even more. <laughs> the, the good news, oh, those are two different questions in my mind. One, one question is about investing safely and hedge, hedging, quote unquote. The other question is, you know, where are returns going to be most interesting? Um, and you know, the most important thing is going back to, I'll answer the hedging question in a little different way. But the, the most important thing is, is you know, when you're thinking about investing is your own, um, your own risk tolerance, obviously, and also um, your longevity and your ability to um, have the money locked up for a bit. And what we talked about is there's been a real structural change of pensions and institutional investors moving towards alternatives. Uh, because they have long, you know, long, um, long liabilities, and they have the ability to lock up that, lock up their assets and investments longer. 
Um, and in those, those asset classes, certainly pay attention to public market valuations, but capture a premium for, for the lack of liquidity. Um, so, you know, it, it, for me, having lived in alternatives for my career, even though I've been, you know, I've managed equity portfolios and public debt portfolios, um, you know, when I see valuations on the whole that are certainly um, on the high side in, in the equity markets, and I see pockets of dislocation um, and ability to access them in private structures where you get illiquidity premium, um, I'm excited that there's still opportunity um, for, um, for finding interesting private investments. And, you know, there's very different private equity strategies, large cap, small cap. But what's clear is large established businesses and in regular businesses, let's put technology away, you know, valuations are high in private equity too. So um, generally I'm, I'm excited by the growth in, in private credit because I think private credit can be bespoke and go to companies that don't have access to the public market. So going back to some of the businesses in the core of our economy in the middle market, um, and, and lower, I think there's a real opportunity there because those companies have less access. Banks are increasing their lending standards because they're worried about employment. And so being able to partner with banks as a private, you know, as in private credit is, is interesting. I think there's a lot of work to be done on infrastructure in our country and globally. So I think there's going to be interesting opportunities for long lived um, long lived investment assets there. And obviously I'm not a venture expert, but you know, um, finding good, solid, multi-decade venture investors to take advantage of growth in entrepreneurism is, is always interesting. Um, but it really just depends on, you know, what kind of investor you are and, and what, what kind of liabilities you have. But I, I do think when, when public markets get, certain parts of public markets get ahead of themselves, um, I still believe there's some illiquidity premium that you can capture in parts of um, uh interesting kind of, I wouldn't call them esoteric, but bespoke strategies in private equity and credit and, um, and uh, infrastructure. And, and clearly real estate has the haves and have nots. So I think there's gonna be opportunity there. That's great. And here, you know, I, I, I apologize in advance to all the people because there's too many questions. I don't think we will uh, manage to answer them all, but, um, what are new post-pandemic key target companies, management, qualitative attributes you look at when investing? Well, it, this is going to be a theme of it. Um, I do believe that the same comments I made about a diverse investment team is the same comments that hold true both in the boardroom and in the management. And, and I don't Diversity for me isn't about um, gender alone or race. Diversity for me is backgrounds and experiences. It's, it takes it a step further. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do pay attention to that. And you do, especially if you're looking at a consumer products company. And um, my favorite story is being in an investment committee. And one of, one of the analysts, who's a se relatively senior guy, was explaining to me the difference between the different lipstick lines that were coming out. And I was sitting in a room with 25 men and I just started laughing in the middle of the meeting. I'm like, have you, you, know, have you talked to any women? You didn't ask me, I'll go try the lipstick. Um, so, you know, really paying attention to what's the market they're targeting. Does their management really have a close um, handle on it? How are they adopting to innovation? For me, it's about adopting to change. I mean, this, this year has taught us that the ability to adapt your perspective and make changes, not too quickly, but be thoughtful about how you have to change to adapt to the new reality, um, have created a new set of leaders um, and, um, and a new set of management, uh, let's say qualities that are, that are really important. Um, so I, uh, I pay attention to that. I pay attention to the pipeline of the management team, like who's the next layer. I think that's the most telling, um, what does the next layer look like? Um, and, uh, and, and obviously always pay attention to the board and the governance. Apologies. I'm jumping from one to the other, but there are so many questions arriving here. There's a question asking. What do you think on SPACs and all the SPAC activity 
there's a lot of four letter words, right? Um, SPAC started, it's, you know, it's hard when you've been in the business and you saw the SPACs in the beginning was like how people got rid of like, you know, it had a bad connotation. Um, uh, I think it's another place of showing the amount of liquidity in the market looking for return. I, I think it's another indication that, uh, that there's real desire for interesting investment ideas that were in the private markets uh, that, can, that, pub, that, that people can get access to. So, um, you know, I think finding new ways to do that is, is innovation, which is good. Um, I think there are, it has been a huge move um, and, um, you know, it's fundamental. Each one is different. There are some management teams that are great fundamental management teams and find this a, a way to capture, instead of spending the next two or three years trying to raise capital for a series of target businesses, they can take advantage of opportunity and at a time when we had a, have a lot of um, interesting opportunities and you want to take advantage of opportunities when there is a, a, a dislocation in the market or, 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 or opportunity in the market. So I think that that's good. Um, and not all are made alike. And the board, and, and by the way, that's a great one to look at boards. It's a shell company. So you better be happy with the way the board looks and the, and the, and the sponsor um, and how many times they've done it and how they, they've done it in their past business. So again, this is not a broad brush stroke. I think people um, think it's a dirty word. It's not, it's just another way of going public but with a sponsorship attached to it. Um, but it is very, each one has, you know, there are some that are, you know, that I'm sure we'll see as great success, just like funds. And there are gonna, some that are going to be top quartile and some you're going to look at um, and uh, it's not going to be as, as strong, um, but, it, but it is flowing a lot of capital in the market. And I think it is also participating in the elevation of value asset valuations because this capital literally burns a hole in your pocket. So, um, so that isn't, that's a dynamic you have to be thoughtful about, particularly with the new ones coming up now. There's just so many of them looking for targets. Now, I think we, I have space only for one more question. And I want to make sure I ask you a question about Kellogg. That is, how did your experience at Kellogg help you move through your career? Well, I, I would say there's a there's a couple, you know, a couple different takeaways. Um, I would say though, number one, I chose Kellogg because not because I wanted to be around people that were going to be future leaders and really thought about management. I came from finance, investment banking. I knew I could get technical skills pretty much at any leading business school. For me, it was an approach um, and in a, a, a broader management career. I will say that for sure, the teamwork and collaboration, people don't apply to Kellogg unless they're excited about that prospect. And, and I was. Um, I didn't realize how pivotal it was gonna be in my career on reaching back to that idea, more heads together, solve a problem. Um, and I still feel that way. Um, the, the most interesting thing is I will say in the last five to 10 years, I have used the, um, the uh, behavioral management class and leadership classes more than I ever thought I would. And I remember I was you know, more of a finance person. So some of these kind of esoteric management cases, I thought, okay, well, this is interesting, but like, what am I, you know, what am I gonna use it? I have used it in spades. And um, so that general, so I, you know, certainly the culture of collaboration and teamwork, technical skills we can get anywhere. And, and, that, and that's the truth. And you wanna have high level of technical skills, but problem solving skills and, and drawing on other people's experiences is the thing that I think is getting people through the pandemic and um, the ability to relate to people um, is something that's super important. So I, I would say those, those, um, those are the things that have carried with me. And so each step of my career, a different part of Kellogg gets pulled out that I'm, I wasn't sure, I, wasn't, I didn't realize I was gonna use so much. 
Actually, I couldn't, I could, you know, I have to tell everybody, I didn't know what she was, what Alex was going to say. And I am so pleased because this is exactly what, especially with the pandemic, we are saying these days, this is what Kellogg has to offer. And what I always say I'm so proud is when I talk to alumni from the past, they will say the same characteristic that we say today. This is really the DNA of Kellogg. And I, I hope uh, you all, uh, you know, uh, hearing uh, Alex uh, talking, you know, she really represent that spirit and uh, how incredibly, you know, uh, smart and expert on uh, so many dimensions. And uh, see, I, I, I am flooded with question. I want to ask you any possible detail about investments, uh, but I, I will pass you all the question later. <laughs> but and, uh, so I apologize if you didn't get your answer, uh, your answer, your question answered, but it, combining that with a general point of view of, uh, you know, of a sense of purpose, like uh, women, diversity, network, and at the same time, also the ability of uh, working together. So thank you so much for making us so proud to call you a Kellogg alumna. Thank you everybody for uh, connecting. I hope uh, you found uh, the conversation inspiring and uh, have a great all the rest of the day or uh, in a, then weekend. Thank you. Thank Alex. you, Francesca. It was my, my, my pleasure. And uh, I wish the whole Kellogg community well uh, managing through this and um, there's, there's lots to do. So um, I look forward to continuing to watch how Kellogg develops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay in touch. Bye. Bye.